All right, you can turn in your Bible to James chapter 5. The book of James chapter 5. Let us begin a prayer war. This is a call to arms. This is a call to fight. And I, de I mean a deadly fight. A fight to the death. This is serious. If you're not interested in whatever else, then go watch something else. I'm looking for warriors for Jesus Christ. And I'm going to include myself in this number because I haven't been fighting on the level that I should have been. James chapter 5, verse 6. Excuse me here. 16, excuse me, not 6. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual. What's the effect that you're looking for? That you can consume it on your own lusts? Oh God, please give me a million dollars. That's not effectual. Okay? That's a lust-based prayer. God, please turn this wicked tyranny back on the evil people that are bringing it to us. Now that's effectual. God, please, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would be mightily upon us. That we would be able to go out and do miracles and things in, in your name. That's effectual. That's, and then you say, what's next? Fervent. What's fervent? Uh, well, okay, I got five minutes that so I can pray here real quick. That's not fervent. Well, I can just pray here before I eat my meal. That's not fervent. Fervent is you pray for hours. We're going to talk about that in this study. How to have effectual, fervent prayer. Acts chapter 12. Let me show you an example of the kind of prayer that is fervent. You say, well, that, you know, the other one there, brother, that's in the book of James. That's, you know, for Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah, and how much more should it be for us today? I am dispensational and I will never be non-dispensational because I'm saved and I'm born again. So I can't be non-dispensational. But uh, you can hide behind the dispensation thing. Uh, Paul wrote that uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Four things he lists there. So if you see something in another dispensation, is there a parallel with it in the Pauline epistles or in what's written there to Christians in the church age? And there is. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17 now about the time Herod the king stretched forth now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also, then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring forth him forth to the people. Okay, Easter is the proper translation, by the way, there. Pascha is the Greek word, and they say it should always be Passover. Uh, no, it shouldn't. It can be translated in different ways. Context determines it. The days of unleavened bread were up there beforehand. Okay, that comes uh, before, I think it is, or it comes after the Passover, I think, is how that whole thing works. So it couldn't have been the Passover. The proper translation is Easter. You can do the research into that. And Greek Orthodox people will tell you that Pascha is their word for Easter. So these devils, these Alexandrian devils that hate the King James Bible, uh, the servants of Satan that try to come and disarm you, uh, take your powerful weapon from you, they'll try to, try to tell you that Easter is a false translation or something. No, it isn't. It's God, God's perfect word. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Without ceasing. Did you get that? Prayer was made without ceasing. Fervent, effectual prayer. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off, from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. 
And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he, wist, he, and he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. This is the kind of miracle working power that I'm talking about. I know that the sign gifts were given, the speaking in tongues, you know, uh, healing of the sick and all that stuff, the miraculous sign gifts were given to confirm the word of the Jews. I get that. But where the where is this in sign gifts? This isn't a sign gift. This is the miracles that the Bible talks about, I believe, that God miraculously, the Lord Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord there, he comes and he busts Peter out of prison. Is that available to us today? Yes. I'm not saying that the sign gifts can, can come back, that we'll go back to the book of Acts and we'll have the sign gifts again or something. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying there is that the miracles, there's miraculous things that the Lord was able to do because prayer was made without ceasing. The Lord could do some amazing things in the future if we're willing to wage warfare, powerful warfare through effectual, fervent prayer. It will avail much. Verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, praying. Many gathered together, praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. But they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. They thought he was dead. It wasn't, oh, you know, Lord, uh, you know, please help him to get out. And whatever. They didn't even know what was going on. And the Lord had already answered their prayers. And I'll tell you right now, there's many times you're praying for something and the Lord's already answered it. And it might take a little while before you realize, oh, wow, he actually answered my prayer. But you see, you're supposed to pray in faith effectual, fervent prayer and not, you know, with doubting and things and whatever else. You start doubting the Lord or you're just, that's an insult to the Lord. You pray with faith. That's where I'm reading to here. Um, verse 16, But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the, the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Um, it might get to that point where Christians start to be put into prison. And it's going to take other Christians to wage war with prayer. Putting on the gospel armor. Putting on Ephesians chapter 6. Go down through so that you're ready for prayer. Get sin out of the camp like they did in the Old Testament. There's sin in the camp. God's not going to let us win our wars. Get that sin out. Stop the sinning. We want some answers to prayer. Very important. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, with that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. But you see it there in verse 27, in fastings 
often, and it's differentiated from in hunger and thirst. So it wasn't, well, he just didn't have much to eat that day, so he called it fasting. No, he just kind of didn't, you know, starving a little bit, didn't have the money. No, no, no. It's different than hunger and thirst. It's fasting. It's pur purposefully going without food. And we're going to talk about the two types of fasting now. All right. And he said fasting often. Praying without ceasing. Fasting often. Remember that. Go to Matthew chapter 6. There are two types of fasting that you'll see in the Bible. There's a ceremonial religious uh, type of fasting. And then there's fervent real prayer. Fasting in real fervent effectual prayer. Let's look at the two types here. Matthew chapter 6 beginning in verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they to love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Um, oh, let's have a men's prayer breakfast, or let's have a, a national day of prayer, and you, and you get all these people out there, and oh God, you know, oh, we thank you for thy beneficence, and, and for thy magnificence, and omnipresence, and, and the blah, 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 and, blah, 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 blah. and they, they do all this big, high-sounding speech and everything else. They're out there to be seen of men. Oh, here comes the, the holy Catholic priest, and he's got the ash mark upon his forehead, and he's, and he's suffering, and oh... You know, and he's down, and then he gets down on the on the floor, and he puts his arms out. You know, and here's the monk laying this way or whatever else, and there, all this. It's ceremonial. It's false religious fasting and prayers. It's not real. Some Catholic in there, there, and you know, they're crawling on their knees up through the thing. If I get down on my knees, you won't see me, but they're crawling on their knees up through the the cathedral, going up each step, and they're praying the rosary, rubbing the little beads. You know. Oh, Mary, full of grace, holy be the womb, you know, all this stuff. Going up the next step on their knees, and they go, they keep going. It's fervent. Might in their mind be effectual, but it's religious ceremony. They're hypocrites. They can't lower themselves enough to pray, God, please save a wretch like me, a wicked sinner like me. Oh, my, no. I'm going to go and I'm going to suffer on my own. Unite my sufferings with those of Christ. <laughs> He doesn't want them. He paid for everything on the cross. Continuing here. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Hide yourself. Be secret about it. Go into a closet. Go into a, a room by yourself and pray. Effectual fervent prayer by yourself, not to be seen of men. Verse 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Uh, you know, use not uh, vain repetitions as the heathen do. Know what I mean? <clears throat> Uh, see if I can find a good one in here. Okay, here we go. Offertory. <clears throat> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Okay, secret. Look down favorably upon those these sacrifices we beseech thee, O Lord, that they may be profitable both to our devotion and salvation through our Lord. And, uh, you just you just get your little book out here, and you just you pray, and you say, "Okay, I'm going to get down on my knees here, and I'm going to flip my beads and stuff, and I'm going to I'm going to just keep reading these things, and I'll, I'll go through the whole book five times a day, and then God will hear me for sure, because I mean, look at that, I went through that thing five times in one day, so certainly God will, yeah, heathen, it's heathen. Okay, you don't need a prayer book if you're saved." If you're born again, you don't have a prayer book. There's nothing in the, the scriptures that talk about a little book of prayers that are written out for you. That's nonsense. I mean, what an insult to the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 8. But not...
Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hmm. <laughs> for thine is the kingdom and, thy, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's one you can pray right there. Written out prayer that you can pray. I don't have a problem with that. But it's basically, Jesus is saying, you don't have to say these exact words per se. He's giving a model that you can pray. Forgiving, forgive us our sins. You know, and, and deliver us from evil and things like that. So, you know, you can use that, you can pray that, but you can also pray your own words. There's no problem with that. Um, but look at verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites are, as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which is see, which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, you're not supposed to do this ceremonial thing and. Oh, I'm fasting and, and, and oh, 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 holiness, oh, you know, it's not what the Lord wants. He wants you to appear like you're not fasting. Don't go out and make a big spectacle of your prayers. You pray to the Lord in secret. And here's the beautiful thing about this. Right now with all the tyranny that's going on in our world, right now with all the evil and everything else that's going on in our world, what we need is warfare. But you don't even have to leave your home. In fact, you can wage that warfare in secret. Hmm. You see, the thing that the elites fear the most, the thing that these devils fear the most, is what's called leaderless resistance. You see, if I would raise up an army, we start out with my subscribers on YouTube, 38,000 strong, okay? And then we go and we get a couple other people to join us and whatever else, more groups, and we eventually get a million people, an army of one million soldiers. And I'm the leader. And I'm, you know, it's the Denlingerite army. Well, what can they do? They can shoot me or bribe me or do whatever other kinds of things. They take me down and it hurts the morale of the army. You see? But what if there's no leader that they can physically go after? Like Jesus Christ. Hmm. They come shoot me. Well, the war goes on. They come shoot some other pastor or some other Christian or whatever else. The war continues. There's no stopping the war. There's no, uh, well, you know, we're really doing good, but now our leader's dead, so what do we do? Leaderless resistance is what these devils fear the most. And that's what we have as Bible-believing Christians. Yeah, I'm going to go wage war set up a van across the road and he's over there and he's surveillancing and what are they doing? What's their next step? When are they leaving? Oh, they're coming out of the house. They have guns and they have weapons and oh, the FBI, you know, let's call the FBI. No, no. How do we wage our war? Oh, I'm just going to go into the closet for a while. I have to go outside for something and they look, the enemy would look at you. Doesn't look like they're fasting. See the point I'm trying to get at here? We can wage our war secretly. Hey, um, I'm just going to go to my room. If you're a teenager and your parents are lost, your whole family's lost, um, I'm just going to go to my room for a while. What are you doing? Well, just, you know, some things in secret. See you later. You go up there and you pray. Hey, uh, come on down. It's time for supper. That's no, okay. I'm not really hungry. More on that here in a minute or two when we get into actual fasting. Um, I have some more important things to do. That's waging warfare. Did we read down to verse 18? Yeah. Um, now we're going to go to fervent real prayer. Joel. Back to the book of Joel. That can show you stuff in the Pauline epistles. I mean, we already did fastings often. Where did Paul get that from? Um, 
He got it from the Old Testament. And, you know, it's just something that saved people have been doing any dispensation going throughout the Bible. So I'm, I can go here to the book of Joel, and it still you know, applies to us today as far as instruction and in righteousness is concerned. Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. Therefore, therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Remember, you don't appear outward to men to fast. Don't rend your garments. The, in other words, rip your garments and things and just, you know, appearing to people. To, no, just come as you are, the way you're dressed. But the heart condition is very sorrowful. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Shall there be evil in the city, and the Lord hath not done it. The book of Amos talks about that. You know what's happening right now to this world? God's sick and tired of the sin. God is saying, okay, you people don't want me. You want to live wickedly, all right? Do a little coronavirus thing there, devil and his little Jesuit minions and all the little other people that are involved. Go ahead, lie to the people. Hurt them badly. It says there, repenteth him of the evil. God can say, okay, You've had enough. Let me uh, pull back here a little bit. Verse 14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Go into your closet and pray. Very interesting. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? You know what's going on right now, brethren? To our shame, there's a lot of atheists out there. They're atheists because of you and I. They're atheists because of the body of Christ. Because they're not seeing the fighting. Where is their God? Where's this miraculous power I've heard about? I believe in science. I don't. I can't believe in your God. This is just a figment of your imagination. It's a fairy tale. There's no reason for them to fear God. Why? Because they see no power in those that are supposedly saved. What do we do? Prepare a fast. Be afflicted. Be mourn. God, we need, we, need, we need your power. We need to declare war on the lost world through prayer, through fasting. And if you look at the list there, gather the people, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breasts, babies, in other words. Let the bridegroom go forth. Let the bride, the priests, everybody. I mean, if I called for a physical war, a lot of my viewers couldn't join me. You're too old or you're too young. You can't go out and fight. I mean, hey, let's, let's go on out here. Let me, I'll give some swords to people. Let's, let's go out and fight a physical war or let's take guns or whatever. You can't fight. You have health problems. But can you fight with prayer? Sure you can. Absolutely. You don't even have to, you know, get all dirtied up and whatever else and rend your garments. Oh, God, help us. You don't even need to do that. All right. I'm not going to eat. I'm just going to go and I'm going to... This whole situation is just so, so bothersome to me. I need to pray. I'm going to go into my closet. I'm going to go into this other room over here where I, I can't be bothered by noises and whatever else. And I'm just going to get down there and I'm just going to start praying. And I'm going to sing hymns to the Lord. Then I'm going to get back to praying again. Then I'm going to read the Bible. Promises of God's Word and say, God, your Word says this. Your Word says that. Lord, we need this back in our lives. Please, Lord, if there's sin in my life, get it out of my life. Please tell me. I'll try my best to repent of it. I want victory over it. Lord, I want victory over this wickedness that's going on in our world right now. I want to fight, Lord. Please. I want to fight. Please, you fight for us. Stop this evil. That's what we need, brethren. 
That's what we have to have. Let me illustrate it this way. Okay? This thing of fasting, prayer and fasting. Um, if you've ever been in love, um, I remember, you know, back first girl I fell in lust with <laughs> was lust, really wasn't love. But I was a I was a teenager, seventeen years old in high school and and I just knew she was going to be the one, and I was making all these plans and everything else, uh, you know, how I'm going to graduate high school and how I'd provide for her and everything else. And she just dumped me. And I remember when I got that letter, and it was just, uh, you know, and, I mean, my whole world just crashed around me. And, it, okay, it's, you know, Brian's time for supper or whatever, time to eat, you know, and sitting there at the table, and I'm just looking at my food, and I just thought, I don't want to eat anything. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I'm so just... My nervous, just, oh, I feel terrible. I can't eat right now. And I just, you know, got away from the table, went up, and I sat there in my room and just, oh, you know, and started crying and whatever else and things. It just broke my heart. Well, that's how it should be when our attitude is there that we want to pray against sin. You know what? I'm so tired of seeing this stuff that's going on. I'm so tired of seeing... You know, you know what irritates me? When I see elderly people and they can barely walk and they're wearing a face mask and I'm thinking, these devils are trying to kill the elderly. To them, they're useless eaters. To a guy like Fauci or Redfield, these guys in the health world, they just look out as people as, as cattle. They don't care. They don't care about the average person. They're saying, hey, you know, okay, face mask thing when you're in, in areas where there might be infection, but don't wear them when you're not driving or don't do this... Just wear them all the time. They could care less. Hey, you know what? Let's not shut the, down the economy. Let's go with standard medical procedure here where you quarantine sick people, not healthy people. Duh. Uh, we can't just quarantine everybody because that would destroy the economy and that would really hurt a lot of people. That would kill millions. And if things aren't turned back, millions will die as a result of this whole thing. All right? If we don't fight against it, millions will die unquestionably you know this this these guys are vexing me lord i'm it just they're breaking my heart i'm seeing little children going to get on the school bus little little small little girls little pigtails and little backpack and she's man oh what in the world what is going on here lord god please stop this hey how about you go and take a break and eat something i don't want to i don't want to my war starts today that going into a big thing and I'm supposed to talk about your fasting and whatever, I'm starting a war. I'm going to start my part in the war and I pray you do the same. Hey, we're going to lock you down. If in, you're in the UK, you already are locked down. A lot of other European countries, a lot of other countries, they're locking people down. They're talking about it here in the States. Okay? Hey, you devils out there, you wicked global elites out there that want to lock people down, you false leaders in this country, that are so out of touch with reality. You have all your money, all your millions and millions of dollars in your bank, so you shutting things down doesn't mean anything to you. Hey, guess what? You lock us down, we're going to pray against you. We're going to wage a war in our closets, praying to the Lord Jesus Christ for your downfall. Praying that the angel of the Lord comes in and makes problems and persecutes you. That's what we want to do. So go ahead, lock us down. We'll wage the war against you. You force us that we can't go out and can't go here and can't go there. All right, we're going to wage a war against you. And we'll see what happens. This is what we need to do. We need to be sorrowful. And we need to grieve for what our nation has become. What your nation has become if you're not an American. God, I'm sorry for the sin. I don't take part in that stuff, but I'm sorry. It's wicked out there. But what they're doing, this tyranny that they're imposing on people, is far more evil. Lord, stop them from doing any more. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5. We're going to look at a couple different instances here of prayer in the Pauline epistles. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. 
for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Oh God, please bless our president and please no, hey, God, I wanna I wanna make some prayer and intercession here for that king, that that all that's in authority, the governor and whatever else. I'd like to see him get saved. I'd like to see Donald Trump really get saved. He's a lost, you know, just wicked fornicating whatever, just evil man right now. I'd like to see the guy actually get saved. I really honestly would. I'd like to see the black pope get saved. God knows I'm telling the truth. I'd like to see it. Will they? More than likely not, okay? Then if you're going to not, if, if you don't want to get saved there, you wicked rulers out there, wicked governors, wicked people in the media, if you don't want to get saved, then I pray God drops you. Why? Because I want to lead a godly life, an all peace, a peaceable, honest, godly life. I don't want to fight. I don't want you making stupid rules that keep me from doing what I need to do throughout the day. Quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's what I want. So I'm going to pray to those ends. We all need to pray to those ends. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Is God your Savior? Well, yeah, praise the Lord. He say he died on the cross to pay for my sins. He shed his precious blood. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Praise the Lord. He's my Savior. Okay, saved you back then, but is he saving you right now? Can he save your job? Can he save your life? Can he save whatever? See, salvation isn't just eternal, right? The Lord has to save you through all kinds of things throughout your life. He has to save you from all kinds of troubles and people trying to destroy you. We have to fight. It's good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay? That's why you pray, Heavenly Father, and ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the way the Lord set it up. It doesn't make them two different gods or two different persons. Those terms aren't in here. That's Trinitarian Satanism. Um, it's just the way the Lord set it up. There's a difference between the soul and the body, in other words. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I've talked about that in other studies. I'm not getting into it here. If you don't get it, well, that's because you're lost. <laughs> Simple. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 22. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. You see, there's always the thing of self-judgment there when it comes to victory in prayer, power in prayer. You have to abstain from evil, all appearance of evil even. But the Bible doesn't say pray occasionally. It says pray without ceasing. Paul says in fastings often. Obviously, you can't fast all the time. You would die. Okay, we get it there. But prayer is supposed to be there, but prayer and fasting is taking it to the next level. And we need to become mighty warriors of prayer. I will confess a fault openly before all. The Lord already knows it, so I don't have to confess it before him because he already knows. I don't pray that much. I do, but not nearly as much as I should, I'm saying. Uh, when I first got saved, I'd pray sometimes for an hour or two. I would. I'm not trying to brag. That's just what I would do. I was a lot more fervent. And I think a lot of that was, you know, what ended up the Lord called me into the ministry. Now it's just kind of, I'm so busy and I just, all right, I turn the cameras on. I know what I'm supposed to do. So I just kind of say, okay, Lord, please help me to say this thing correctly and, and, and just uh, help me to do a good job at this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And I go on. Because to me, it's, I, okay, I have my duty. I'm just, I know what I'm supposed to do. So I don't have to get on my knees and pray for hours about this study or whatever. And a lot of times I'm stumbling all over myself. I need to be more fervent in my prayer. What about you? How many hours a day do you spend in prayer? We need to judge ourselves, brethren. We can have power. Don't give up because, you know, well, 
it's just supposed to happen. There's the falling away and this is that and that. And, you know, what's so the Lord's coming soon. So let's just let's lay our weapons down. Let's just kind of close our Bibles and stick it over here on the shelf someplace. And and OK. All right, Lord, I've done all I could for this earth. Let's go. Uh, no, uh, there's still work, still work to do. The Lord still has us here for a reason. And um, I will never, ever back off on the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, ever. Um, but you can use that thing as a crutch, brethren. It's a bailout, like I preached a while back. You know, you can use that thing as a bailout. Hey, there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of things, but the Lord's going to be coming and take us in a, uh, taking us out of here, so I don't need to fight. We're called to fight. And we need to do that with prayer and fasting. That is the most mighty type of warfare that we have. That's what I talked about in the last study. Ephesians chapter 6. It doesn't say, you know, put on the whole armor of God so, and then let's go out on the streets and let's actually fight people. Let's kill people and whatever else. That's not what it's saying. Um, there's nothing in the New Testament where the Lord's saying, okay, and he raises up Paul and he says, all right, Paul, gather to yourself 3,000 armed men and go on out there and wipe out those Romans. He didn't do that. Now, you know, there were times throughout church history where Puritans especially would stand up and they would fight against the Catholics and whatever in battle, and they won very well. This, you know, my sword here, Oliver Cromwell, based on the sword that he carried into battle, um, yeah, God was for them. God was with them. They won mighty victories. So I'm not against physical warfare, not at all. But uh, I remember hearing a story the one time about Cromwell, just to tell you a little story here about prayer. And one of the battles, I don't remember if it was Naseby or, or it was one of the battles that he was in. And, uh, and he went to his men and he said, first of all, he told all of his officers, I don't want any profanity at all from any of my officers. Try that in the modern military. Yeah, right. Um, and he said, uh, I believe the Lord's going to deliver the king and the royalists there. I believe he'll deliver them into our hands. But we are very much outnumbered. I forget if it was two to one, three to one. They were vastly outnumbered. The enemy had a lot more troops than they did. And he said, uh, I believe the Lord's going to deliver them into our hands. And what I want all of my men to do is I want you all to pray all night in the rain. And at the light of dawn, we'll go into battle. If the Lord gives them into our hands, we'll, we'll go into this battle. And those soldiers are out there all night long. Lord God, please help us to be able to win this battle. And, and oh, Heavenly Father, if there's some sin in me, and it's all night long in the rain and the cold. And they won the battle. What battles could we win if we would pray all night long? Or even for a few hours? Could we turn back this coronavirus stuff? The black pope comes out and he says, it can't ever go back. It won't go back. Who's more powerful, the black pope or the Lord? I'd love to just stick it in that stinking black pope's face and say, you're wrong. We will take it back. And we will take it back to a new standard of righteousness because God's people are no longer playing games. We're no longer going to our little church buildings and whatever else. I thank the Lord for one thing about this coronavirus thing, and that is people are starting to wake up to what church buildings are all about. That big old pastor that's up there, nobody tells me to say what I'm saying in my pulpit, amen. This is my church, and if you don't like it, there's the door, amen. And all of a sudden the government comes in and says, uh, you have to shut the doors. And big, big mouth Baptist preacher all of a sudden is, oh, well, you know, okay, all right, okay. And then when they can finally reopen, when the government lets them come back, then it's, all right, um, I'm, I'm sorry, brother and sister, but you're going to have to sit over there and keep your mask on, and, and I'm sorry. And what happened to the bravery there, big mouth preacher? And so people are starting to wake up. And I've gotten letters. I've gotten lots of letters this year from people saying, I thought you were a nut before. Attacking the church buildings all the time. And then I saw this whole coronavirus thing and our pastor that I trusted all of a sudden is shutting the doors and I'm saying, what is going on? 
And I'm done with the whole church building thing. Praise the Lord. That's good. Get out of the church buildings and get back to the Bible so that we can have some power. And you people out there that have left the church buildings, I thank the Lord for you. I thank the Lord that you finally have gotten out of that system that's not based in the Scriptures. And you know what? I want you to join the army. I want you to get serious. I want you to pray and fast. Let's start a war. Let's wage warfare on these wicked tyrants. Let's wage warfare on the black pope. Let's wage warfare on all these others out there that are for this. Let's fight. Acts chapter 5. We're going to end here in Acts chapter 5. Now I'll make some points here before we close this study out. Tell you how to do the thing of praying and fasting. But I just want to read another account here of, in Scripture. Very important. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 down through 10. There you have Ananias and Sapphira, this couple, and they're lying basically to the, you know, Peter and the, and the others, and they're saying, oh, um, you know, uh, we sold this land, and, and they agreed that they kept back part of it, and, you know, they're they're basically scamming them, making themselves look good. Oh, we sold land, and look, here's the money. We're going to give it over. And Peter's saying, you know, is this all that you sold it for? Well, yes, of course. And they're keeping some of the money for themselves. And so Peter rebukes them, and they both drop dead, if you read the story. Husband first, and then the wife. But look at verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Great fear in the church? When's the last time you heard that of a group of Christians? Great fear upon the church. But look at what it also says. And upon as many as heard these things. Wouldn't it be something if all of a sudden we'd start praying? Then we get real serious and we wage this prayer war. And all of a sudden key members of the coronavirus scam start dropping dead like flies. Oh, wow. Wow. Wow, look at that. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that something what prayer can do? And all of a sudden, word starts to get out, and they say, oh, these Bible believers are starting to pray and is starting to drop you know, key players and key people in this whole thing. What happens as a result of that? Verse 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So it's still there. You see the signs happening and things. There they're in Solomon's porch there at the Jewish synagogue. Verse 13. And of the rest, durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Nobody wanted to join them. You know, who wants to join these Bible believers? Not me. You get in there and they mess with them, you'll drop dead. That's a group to, to be careful of. Wouldn't that be good if people were saying that about us? They don't want to join us. But yet the people magnify them. Hey, those people, yeah, they're, they're kind of... Stay away from that group, but I'll tell you what, they're something else. They have guts. They have character. They're brave. You can't force them to do things. That should be our testimony among the lost. Verse 14, and believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes both of men and women. News this evening. Dr. Anthony Fauci found dead, massive heart attack. And um, Dr. Robert Redfield, uh, the two Jesuits that have been lying the most about this whole thing. Um, he was killed in a car accident. Um, seems that we've had some reports that there's some Bible believers out there that are praying, that they've been saying about pray for either the conversion or the death of Fauci. If he doesn't want to get saved, then I pray the Lord drops him. Um, hmm. Uh, I don't want to join that group, but they're hitting all these people, key targets. The black pope just stepped down. Major scandal came out about him. Something that was completely hidden. And this happened, and that happened, and all of a sudden, states are starting to reopen again, and things are starting to occur, and whatever else, and now people are saying, 
And there's a power here among these Bible believers. You know what would happen to a lot of people? They start to look at this book differently. The word of the, of, of the Lord here would be magnified. And people would say, what book is it that these people are reading? Bible believer? What? Which Bible? Any Bible? Because I have an NIV. I have a New American Standard Version. And, you know, what's, but what's this Bible that they're using? King James Bible? Really? All these people that are doing this praying and making these mighty things happen, they're reading King James Bible? i, I got to get a copy of that. See, it isn't just, you know, oh, let's, let's, let's fight in prayer against this wickedness so we can have our nice little life back. No, it's let's fight in prayer against this wickedness so we can see people genuinely get born again. Not the little false converts that come in and play Christian for a little while and then all of a sudden they get their toes stepped on and then it's, phew, and they run off. And I was, I was part of that group and I was part of that cult and I came out of it. And... You know, if we had power... If we had a lot more spiritual power because we're praying and fasting, these devils wouldn't want to get anywhere near us. They wouldn't want to inf infiltrate our ranks. They'd be too scared. But they infiltrate because we don't have much power. They infiltrate because we, uh, we don't spend the time in prayer. Judge myself. You judge yourself. How much time are you really spending in prayer? How much time are you fasting? You can make a change. We all need to make a change. So let me just say it one more time. Let me just recap a few points here and then we'll be done with this study. Fasting. What is fasting? Um, your heart's broken. You look at the food and you just say, I don't want it. Whatever broke my heart is more important to me than eating. I'm weeping. I'm mourning. I can't believe that they're doing this. I can't believe, look at that old person walking by. Look at the little little child. Look at this, look at, look at this. Oh, Lord, God, please stop this. Please, God, we need a solution to this. God, show me what to do. Tell me what to do. Please, God, fight for us. Well, what time is it? Wow, I've been, I've been kneeling here for two hours. I didn't even realize it. Hey, Lord, how about I sing a hymn? I want to sing a hymn of praise. Lord, I want to read your word. I'm going to spend some time. I'm going to shut off YouTube. I'm going to shut off the computer. Don't want to hear it right now. I'm going to go someplace and I'm going to get your word and I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read and read and read your word and I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray some more and I'm going to sing another hymn or I'm going to go back to reading the Bible and I'm just going to do this and do this and do this. I'm, I'm going to skip my meals. Hey, they just locked me down again. I can't go out of the house. Okay, there you go. Wage the warfare. Lord, who's involved in my country? Who are the people that are giving the stay-at-home orders? Who are the people that are shutting down the economy and messing this up and messing that up? I'm going to pray for them. Save them, Lord. Or else, send the angel of the Lord to persecute them. Make their life miserable. Stop them, Lord. If they have no desire for salvation, then get rid of them. Let's put the fear of God upon these wicked devils. Let's wage a war against these people. We have to. I'm going to do my very best. And I pray that you do your very best. We need to get more serious. Um, I did a sermon many years ago about the thing of the sacrifice of thanksgiving and it is a sacrifice in your King James Bible giving thanksgiving for things you know the Bible says in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you um, in everything uh, thank God for this coronavirus thing that's gotten us to this point of repentance Thank God for the coronavirus thing that has gotten this nation to the point where they can see that the churches are fake. That the pastors are hirelings. Well, then when the wolf comes, they just run away and, and leave the sheep there. I mean, where are the pastors that are giving nutritional advice how to fight the coronavirus? I did. 
back in the spring when everything was just starting to come out and they were they hadn't even done the, the lockdown thing yet. Um, where were the others? I know glory to me or whatever else. You know, I just, I care about people. What about the guys in the church buildings? They don't care. They care about the money. <laughs> we have to fight, brethren. That's all I can say. I pray you take this very, very serious. Um, let's see what the Lord can do. And it's not going to take uh, hundreds and thousands of us to do this. It could happen with a very few number, a very small number, that we need to get serious. Um, obviously, if you're a nursing mother or something like that, or if you have health you know, conditions, well, don't fast. You know, especially as a nursing mother, you have your baby thinking about, you know, to think about there. Um, but if you, can, if you can skip a meal or even a few meals or whatever else, um, it doesn't have to be 40 days like the Lord did or something. Most of us can't handle that. But, uh, and you can do different types of fasts. You can just simply say, I'm not going to eat. But uh, Lord, I'm, as I'm praying and I'm singing and whatever else, my throat's getting a little bit dry. Drink a little bit of water. Go back to praying. Um, doesn't mean you have to abstain completely from any food and drink. Uh, and t well, drink, I should say. Food, yes. Um, just the way you fast is you just simply say, okay, um, tonight I'm going to, uh, instead of eating this evening meal, um, I'm going to spend that time in prayer. And you don't binge eat so that you can make it through the thing. No, the point is you're putting your flesh down and you're saying, okay, Lord, I'm so serious about this. I want an answer to prayer. I'm going to skip a meal. Okay, and I'm going to pray. And Lord, you can get me through to till the next day or whenever, when I can eat again. Um, that's what you need to do when you fast. Um, and again, the difference, again, with the, like you have Lent and things among the Catholics and, and some of this stuff, where they'll give up certain things and they'll go in with their ash on their forehead and they're saying, oh, there's things and whatever else, being ultra holy knowing that when this time is over, they're really going to indulge. You know, okay, I'll give up this stuff, but man, when it's over, I'm going to go out and you know, really live it up. That's not the idea here. Um, when you pray and fast, you're not saying, I'm going to binge eat before, not eat, and then I'm going to binge eat like crazy when I'm done. That isn't it. When you truly fast, and I have done it a number of times, I haven't in a long time, um, but when you truly fast you'll feel the power of the Lord coming into your life. And all of a sudden you realize, hey, I'm not really hungry. And it might, you know, you might be hungry for a little while, but then you'll realize my hunger's gone because you're focused on prayer. And you're, you're truly, I mean, you might get to a point where you're weeping and you're crying and saying, Lord, God, please, we need an answer here. We need, we need you to fight for us. So that's the difference there. Um, please, please, please do spend time in prayer and fasting. Um, it's so very important right now. In every country, we have to fight this tyranny. We have to fight against it. And the only way we can do it, the only way that will work, is effectual fervent prayer. That is going to be it. I thank you for watching, and I pray that you spend some time in prayer and fasting.